Hello and welcome to another edition of Around the Coin. I'm your host, Faisal Khan, and with me is Brian Romney. Hey, Brian, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, Faisal. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. What have you been up to? Well, I went on an adventure to an island called Exuma, and that's in the Bahamas. And uh, it's part of an island chain of over 365 islands, part of a greater island chain of over 700 islands in the Caribbean, uh, you know, off the coast of Florida. And it was a wild adventure, I got to say, just uh, um, something that is recommended to anybody, especially with children, uh, the adventure out there. So it's uh, the pig island, right? That's what you just told me before the pre-show. It has uh, swimming, swimming pigs. Yeah, that's one of the attractions. And it sounds sort of bizarre and off the wall and sort of like, you know, spend a day doing that, whatever. Um, it actually is a very interesting history when Columbus's uh, crew came back or some of the ones that stayed, <laughs> the ones that didn't volunteer, including. They brought pigs with them and they brought chickens. And some of these pigs um, have been on the islands since then, uh, especially the ones that ran away and got abandoned and shipwrecked and floated to other islands, whatever. And so they have a population of indigenous pigs that have uh, become feral. Uh, they, they've gotten back to their roots, and most of them know how to swim quite well. Some even eat, eat uh, fish in the, um, uh, in, in the bays and, and, uh, and some of the keys, so they can actually go fishing. I witnessed one pig grab a fish on the side and just started eating it, and that technically is not supposed to happen. Uh, it's rare. They tend to be mostly just uh, eating greens. A lot of them uh, will eat seaweed, and I watch them munch on that also. So they, um, uh, the ones that are, don't see tourists very often. So it is a in really incredible experience for anybody, and children just instantly take to this. They're extremely clean animals, very intelligent, and I'd recommend it to anybody. We also got to swim and hang with dolphins and obviously explore the beaches and uh, and do a lot of snorkeling. It was just amazing, amazing. What were you up to, sir? What, did, what have you done? Uh, been planning for the conferences coming up, so just a little bit of announcements. 28th and 29th of August, the Global Payment Summit in Singapore is happening, so we'll be there. And if you want to come and say hello, please do so. On the 30th of August, there is Startup Bootcamp, which is the FinTech Singapore uh, initiative. I'll be speaking over there on the fragmentation of payments. So, again, come up and say hello. On the 22nd, 20th through 22nd of September, IMTC, which is the International Money Transfer Conference uh, in Africa, uh, will be happening in Nairobi, Kenya. So if you're going to be attending over there, please, as always, come and say hello. Uh, we will be having Kathleen Brightman, who's one of the co-founders of Tezos, um, on a pre-ICO show. She was here earlier on, um, I think a couple of weeks back, when she was doing her uh, Tezos ICO, which is the second highest uh, raise ever done on an ICO. Uh, we'll also have, uh, yeah, it's, that was a very successful one, and we'll, we'll have her and talk about and ask her questions, you know, uh, everything that we've, we've been dying to ask. And recently, she just put up a 50 million uh, fintech fund with the ICO money, so we'll also speak on that. Also, we have um, Nakwa Mbele, uh, who is a fintech recruiter based out of Toronto. She's one of the new pool of co-hosts on Around the Coin that we'll be announcing. And we'll be calling her to speak about the job and the recruitment scene that's happening in the blockchain slash crypto world. And, you know, what what's the what, what does the ecosystem look like? How can people transition their career into this, uh, the blockchain, which is supposed to be the next big thing? And what's demand like and what's reality like? Uh, so we'll have her on the show next week as well. And just one last thing, which is, you know, we did the show uh, with uh, Jordan Lempi of Dwala. He's the head of strategic projects over there. On the report that came out, the final report that came out from the Faster Payment Task Force by the Federal Reserve, uh, it's called the you know the Faster Payment Task Force uh, Call to Action for Having um, Faster Payments in the U.S. So that show was episode 143. If you want to listen to it, and um, Brian, an Im important announcement. Remember, in the show that we did a couple of shows back, we talked about the split the fork of bitcoin and you spit particularly went and talked about an example of coinbase 
And I understand and I'm led to believe that Coinbase reached out to you after that show. Yes, I was um, had the pleasure of uh, speaking to one of the um, one of the people that are involved in the technology side of Coinbase, and we had a very cordial, very interesting uh, uh, exchange about the philosophy of what this all means. And you know, the, the, simply put, what we're looking at is a brand new modality, right? I mean, you, you've had stock splits, you've had other things in history. Uh, you know, some attorneys equated it to having a, say, a cow that has a calf. And what does that become when it's on somebody else's land? Is a, Who owns that calf? And I, I'm of the mindset that um, you're going to see dozens, if not hundreds, of fractures of Bitcoin. Uh, and I think anybody that's been on the Bitcoin ride from day one is going to profit from this immensely. And, you know, we can sit there and philosophize about, is this good or bad? It, it, you know, is it, is it uh, all going to be used? You know, anybody who's been listening to this show from the early days, I've been a promoter of alternative coins from day one. Uh, as a miner and also just from a philosophical standpoint, if you want to bring philosophy into it, uh, there should not be a single coin. It should be as many as people want. Now, what's going to happen is people are going to gestate towards those things that they believe that has higher value. One could look at it sort of like ore, you know, mining for ore, ore right? And when you're mining for ore, sometimes you run into things that are worthless, uh, in Nevada, there were a lot of gold uh, miners that were just throwing these ore rocks that they discovered, and uh, you know parts of the Southwest too, even Texas. These junk rocks. Oh, I don't want this rock. I don't want this rock. And then around the 1950s, all of a sudden, those rocks that they thought was junk turned out to be extremely valuable. That was called uranium, and that radioactivity made the uranium thousands of times more valuable than gold. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen with some of these coins. You know, Ethereum, obviously, and the ICOs, we'll talk about that later in the show, uh, are some of those examples. But let's get back to Bitcoin Cash. Or I was saying, uh, I think we were calling it BCC back then. Now the official terminology is BCH. So let's uh, convert to that. So BCH, when it was born, went up to around $700 the moment it split from Bitcoin. It's now, it's now sunk to a low $297. Here's the fun part about this. If you own Bitcoin before the break and it was held in a wallet or held in an institutional wallet where there were promises made, you now have, at this moment of recording, $297.43 of new value. Now you can reject for every bit for every Bitcoin that you owned. That's right. Yeah, I'm I'm going to use whole Bitcoin numbers. Now, everybody said the world would end. Bitcoin would plummet, plummet. Bitcoin Cash would plummet. And the reality is, those of us who study game theory and history knew that neither was going to happen. Now, will one dominate over the other? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. It's going to be Bitcoin. In fact, I think. In 20 years, when they look back, and hopefully they are listening to the shows that we've done. I mean, we're we're pioneers in this space. Um, when they look back, they're going to say, "Wow, how did they ever not think that this was going to be the lead on this?" You know? <laughs> and and what are we calling it? The Bitcoin Classic. Yeah, I you know I, I just call it Bitcoin, and I call the other one Bitcoin Cash. Uh, or if you just want to be really cool, you just BTC versus BCH. But at the the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that right before our very eyes, we're seeing the decoupling of the entire financial system, for better or for worse. I didn't bring it about. Faisal didn't bring it about. Nobody listening to us has brought it about. It didn't happen. Which brings me to another question. You know, today, as you already know, which is the 12th or 13th of August, Bitcoin yes. hit a high of $4,195. I was actually watching it when I was doing it. It's about yeah. 4009 right now as we are recording the show. Yeah. Uh, it's inevitable, and many 
pundits have been saying, there's a lot of news indicators, etc., that there is a correction, a global economic correction that's that will come. Maybe it'll start from the U.S., maybe it won't, most likely U.S., maybe China, maybe both. But a correction is coming nonetheless. A financial crisis is coming. Do you think this time we will see more wealth being parked on the Bitcoin slash the blockchain than previously when it wasn't available? Faisal, that's a brilliant, brilliant question. Great analysis there. You know, you got to really look at this from the point of view of even somebody with, you know, very, you know, small means, you know, I, whatever you want to judge it as, you know, when you look at what happens during a financial crisis, which is sort of one of the reasons why we're seeing Bitcoin go up. I mean, there's a lot of dynamic factors in here. Some of it is Ethereum. Some of those uh, impacts of the ICOs are impacting Bitcoin. Absolutely. Some of it is flight capital in, in parts of the world that are going crazy. You can look at Argentina uh, and, uh, and and parts of Sa- Venezuela. South America. Venezuela yeah, and, and parts of South America. There's all sorts of problems. Venezuela is interesting in the fact that there is still a tremendous amount of generational wealth that is not ill-gotten gains necessarily. Everybody just looks at this as like, oh, it's dirty money or whatever. You know, um, everybody's money is dirty. I don't care what population, what part of the world, everybody's currency has people that hold illegal cash. But in this case, uh, you have people who are sitting there watching inflation eat away at generations of hard work. And, you know, and they're helpless. They're totally helpless. That's right. A, a nugget of gold cannot be taken to the grocery store with a knife. And, you know, you can't shave off a little bit of it and say, OK, that's the grocery bill that I'm giving you. You know, Bitcoin can do it, but the nugget of gold can't. Exactly. And, and there's even more than that. I mean, some people are contemplating the entire destruction of the financial and um, civic infrastructure in some of these countries, right? Some smaller countries are going to experience that, unfortunately, in the next couple of years. Some will surprise us. And, um, you know, parts of this is even going to come, uh, come to play in the United States and Europe and the quote-unquote developed countries. There are forces that are taking place that want to, in, in some ways to ferment um, a social disorder, uh, and some people believe that that's the way you organize new civilizations. It turns out it's never worked that way in history, but you know we'll see. We'll see how they uh, how they do this time. Um, you know, the bottom line is individuals that are in the water. Let's use the water analogy. You have people who all of a sudden have been thrown in the water, and they can choose to try to stand on other people to get air, or they can choose to find driftwood. Uh, to try to hold on to. Now, that driftwood may not be ordained by experts as being a flotation device. It may not be considered a legal craft, but it does keep them above water. It does keep them alive. And in fact, if they find enough pieces of driftwood, they might have themselves a ship or an or Noah's Ark, if you will, to protect themselves. And I are think you, that's Are you calling analogy. Bitcoin Noah's Ark? I, I, I tell you... I led here not that's a, by That's accident. a beautiful an- a- analogy, yeah. by the way. I'll give you that much. Thank but, you. you know, but, but, uh, I, uh, but, but, but driftwood, I like that word. I mean, yeah. it is a saver. Any, and anyone can get a, save, you know, a driftwood rather than a Noah's Ark. That's right. But I, I guess I, I'm coming here by, by a, a point of purpose. And that is, you know, yes, certainly we do need organized financial systems and all the different things that civic societies are creating. But there is also families and there are people that are scared. And they look at the world and they say, what can I hold on to? Well, nothing's a guarantee. And I've said this, and I will say probably anytime I say this, uh, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. No, it's no, that's going- fine. That's fine. But that's fine. But, but, but the, the statement you just made, what can I hold on to? That's it. Uh, you know, this is in my control. It's in control with, quote, unquote, and please don't roll your eyes when I say this, my people. You know, yes. It's not an institution. It's on a peer-to-peer level. It's in wallets that I can have. It's no one can yank it away from me, not even my government, if they try to. So I have huge amounts of control in it. And that is so, so, so very important. You know, uh, specifically the fact that 
we know for a fact that this is going to happen that the, and, and economic correction is going to happen so if i can take my wealth and very easily park it because previously uh the the safe instruments if you will were were doled out to people with very high net worth that's right doled out to people who had a minimum balance 100 million dollars or something like that (laughs) were doled out to people you know were, were doled out to people that had connections here anyone who understands very basic computer terminology and technology can park their money safely yes it will fluctuate but at least it will not just vanish away you know i wish all the pension funds would go oh, away. yeah well yeah exactly you know and faisal we've talked about this back in the very first couple of shows you know i sat down with people that are just game theory experts i mean i, I i've got a big background in game theory and i sat around with people who are physicists and i sat around with people who are wealth fund managers for the extremely extremely wealthy and i'll start with the wealth fund manager you know, I, I'd say I'd say to this uh, particular individual, and he, he, this three or four of them that I actually communicate with, I said, "What's this whole thing about modern art? What's the whole thing about the investing of the modern art? I mean, I know it, but I just want to hear what you say. Uh, tell me, like I've never known before. And when you hear the stories of why the extremely wealthy would take and put their money in some abstract art, I mean, literally, splots of paint on a canvas. I'm sorry, folks." That's all it is. But there's people putting money behind it because there is a perception that this is a great artist and what he did was great art. Now, there is a fact of life that most common people don't understand. A tremendous amount of wealth is transferred and held in abstract modern art and, of course, classic art, older art. Uh, And it usually requires that artist to pass away, sometimes tragically, for that art to become immensely valuable. And so you'll see a, a canvas worth maybe about $150 and maybe about $50 worth of paint. So let's say $200 worth of paint, no, $200 worth of investment. Sometimes go to $80, $100, 200000000 million. And you have to scratch your head. Now, hold that thought in your mind. You may or may not agree with that art. And there's people running around today saying, how dare these people put their wealth in a thing that's nothing but a bunch of numbers? It has no intrinsic value, you know? And some will argue, well, I can at least I can look at this art. You want to know something? 90% of modern art that's investment grade is not seen by anybody. You don't hang it up on the wall. You can't eat it. It's very hard to transfer that wealth in a downturning economy, yet somehow people hold wealth in that. And um, when you look at when countries invade other countries, you can look at World War II, World War I, but definitely World War II, uh, the Nazis, the real Nazis, took over the wealth of those countries by going after their art and then going after their gold and going other other things. Later on, they went after the currency, but they realized that the currency would become more or less irrelevant if they were truly successful in their campaigns. Um, the art was there for a lot of reasons to go after. They knew that generational wealth was tied up into that. And again, it's all a construct in somebody's mind. So what I'm trying to do here is give people who have not really fully understood this phenomenon to take a number of steps back and to say, what does this mean for me? You know, I don't invest in modern art. I don't, can't find some starving artist, you know, give them $10,000 for their latest work and then sit on it and then, you know, go to Christie's and auction it off for a hundred million dollars. How do these other people do it? Because they're market makers. There's a whole organized group of individuals that decide what modern art is the right modern art and what isn't. And the rest of us is stare helplessly looking at this saying, what the heck's going on here? And that's how one group lives. Now, Back in those early days when we were starting the show, what really motivated me to start talking about it more publicly and, and why I, I thought this was such a great idea is you start looking at what game theory is about and my study of the history of money. You know, it started when I was a teenager, you know, in the 70s, really. Um, 
And I got to hold my very first Sumerian ring coin. And I realized this brass ring was an abstraction that somebody created and they assigned a wealth to it. It was called a shekel, shek, share of wheat, coal, value. You know, shek is a share and coal is a wheat. And so it's a value. It was a value system. But it was an abstraction over the share of wheat. It took two generations According to their own history in the cuneiform that they wrote on the clay tablets, it took two generations for that abstraction to become what we call now currency. And it was originally currency before money. Currency was about flow. Current is a root word of current, a flow of value. And their belief of what that looked like in their early days is much different than what we see as money today. I don't want to go down that dark alley because it's a bit dark because it makes us face what we're all doing in our life and what money is and the digital, you know, abstractions on screens that could destroy us. Moving the decimal place one direction, uh, let's say to the right can literally destroy people moving a lot of directions to the left can make them ostensibly happier. And it's no different through all these societies. So now we move to Bitcoin we move to other forms of abstraction currency. It's no difference, you know, and this, idea of full faith and 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 uh, value of a country. That is important and that is good. And I'm not saying that's going anywhere. But the full faith Brian, and value. Go ahead. In an economic crash, do the cryptocurrencies crash no. in parallel? No. Or do they does real movie money really move to gold and other precious metals and tangible commodities? In, in, in this day and age, in this day and age, I have to cr uh, say that because yeah, in, in the age, last yeah. crash, in the last crash, there wasn't this option, right? In this day and age, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, you're, you, when there is a financial crisis, because I really think it's going to be more than a crash. It's going to be a crisis. And a lot of it is going to be brought about by uh, politics around the world. And a lot of it didn't have, have to happen. But it's going to happen because that's what people want, right? They don't like what they see, and so they're going to tear it down, and let's see what they replace it with. But that's kind of what the um, – and it'll make sense a year from now what I'm talking about. Um, you know, in the meantime, what we call our financial markets around the world are going to suffer immeasurably. And there is going to be a flight uh, to safety and it's going to move in all sorts of directions. It's going to cause wild swings in, uh, you know, direct coins and alternative derivative coins and uh, ICO type of arrangements, contracts, Ethereum. And it might permanently change the way we see all financial systems. Some, some of my friends that really study this, these are more the physicists and mathematicians. They have nothing to do with cryptocurrency. They just study it, and of course, they invest in it because they know logically. But they study it and they say, you know, when the big one comes, what will resurface is this. And what this means is this cryptographic-based financial system. And it will wind up just like the way the cellular phone never came to some parts of the undeveloped world. It will become that direct sort of a direct de democracy, if you will, of finance. And, you know, those people got onto Noah's Ark and protected themselves from the flooding that may come. Um, they will be doing very well. I mean, I know individuals in uh, five, six years ago, you know, 500, two or 3,000 Bitcoins, four or 5,000 Bitcoins. They never let go of them. They're not, they're not technologists. They're not anybody elite. You know, do the math today. And listen, the bottom line is these individuals are telling me that Bitcoin's going to be moving to the million dollar mark. And that's just a number. It's just a number, yes, absolutely picked out of the air because it's a number that begs your attention. I think $4,000 should beg your attention. You know, I think when it went down to $1,900 a few weeks ago and you were in that shoulda, coulda, woulda mode. Oh, it's going down. I'm glad I didn't buy. You know, now you're looking at it, and you're gonna. And there's so many people now that are bobbing up and themselves. down. <laughs> but there's so many people, Faisal, that are gonna go up and down this thought pattern. Guess what? Here's it, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna show you my crystal ball. Bitcoin's gonna go down. It's gonna crash. All right, folks, definitely gonna happen. All right, here we go again. Bitcoin's gonna rise, and it's gonna rise much higher than ever did before, and then it's gonna go down again. And that's going to keep going on. It ain't going to stop. 
because this is this is how this new system is going to work. Now, the opportunity for anybody is either to remove the volatility, that's an abstraction on top of Bitcoin, and some people may want to pay a value for that safe haven, new financial systems built around it. Um, some people may want this volatility. Why? Because I know people who spend all day trading going up, trading going down. You know, yeah, I mean, people- I can tell you a, f- a friend of mine, you know, he has about just shy of, I think, 11 Bitcoins. And every day, religiously, he trades twice a day. Uh, his trading session lasts for about two hours, sometimes less. And I ask him, I say, what's his strategy? And he says he looks at things like, I don't know, candlesticks and moving yeah. averages and... Um, Rabbit, rabbit's foot, uh, uh, astrology, I, I, I don't know. crystal ball. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but, whatever, but, yeah. but, but, but at the end of the day, I said, what do you do, seriously? He says, man, I just wait for a 10 or a $15 move. And if it's 15 or $20, I take my cut. That's it. I've made $200, $300, uh, $400 yeah. a day. And some days I lose money on an average 22 to 24 days off the month. He makes money. Uh, sometimes he loses out. So basically he nets in somewhere around the $8,000 mark, which is not bad considering. Not bad. Now, well, Faisal, extrapolate that amongst, let's say, two or three or 4,000 uh, high-level traders in Wall Street. They're not immune to what they're seeing to this. And slowly but surely... Some of them are either quitting their jobs or motivating their bosses. Or, or bringing their systems to do automated trading right here and beat the crap out of regular traders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I get it. I get it, man. Yeah. So, so now let's just, let's just imagine that hasn't even happened yet to a greater degree. Now let's imagine when, let's just say 10% of the people that were normally trading stocks and bonds and other assets and derivatives of those assets. Imagine what Bitcoin is going to look like then. It's easily, easily over $20,000 at that point, just because of the footprint of finance that would be brought into it. And why is it at Bitcoin? Because it's already established. It's a psychological, it's a psychological thing. This is all psychological. It has nothing to do with mathematics, has nothing to do with um, the high level thinking some people are trying to put into this. It is very much the limbic system. And guess what? That's the way humans have been since we started creating abstraction currencies. It's always been that way. The difference is we dilute ourselves into thinking it's something much more complex than what it really is. And in the final analysis, when we look at it, we'll say, my gosh, this was very simple. I made this so complex. I made this so uh, complicated. But... What I'm trying to say basically is there's a lot of inputs that control the perceived value. Some of it is uh, fear. You know, let's just say there's a whole lot of people in India and China that are going to wonder what happens because some of those folks are in the lower economic uh, rungs and they used to have generational wealth in gold, right, or silver or something of value. And that was their bank because their banking systems were untrustworthy. Now this modern generation is looking at it and says, mom, pop, let's sell some of the gold. Let's move into Bitcoin. And they do that first rise up where it moves $1,000 higher and her $1,000 more wealthier in their currency. You know, that is a, that's a big impact. Oh, then it goes down and then it gets scared and then it goes up. If it's generational wealth, you don't really care. If you're smart, you take a step back and say, hey, I don't care what the daily swings are. I know it's I know it's ultimately going to go to this destination. It's like being on the water. Spend a lot of time in the water the last 10 days. Uh, you know, you're up and down and you, you know that you're going to get there, but the waves and the wind aren't always your, you know, in your favor. But you generally know if you aim your boat and you guide it, and that is, you know, you know your ambition to, to move in a certain direction, it's probably going to go in that direction. Now, are there... Are there downsides? Oh, yes. There absolutely are there downsides. But, you know, those are the same downsides when it was $50. I think when we first started talking, Faisal, what was it? Maybe $100? $150? People were listening to our show when this Bitcoin was $150, right? So you could have gone, I would say most of 
middle class society could have afforded to buy a few bitcoins when it was $150 easily. And it's kind of say, you know, it's a small investment. Put it aside. Bitcoin turns to $1 million, a coin. And you were able to say, I don't know, let's just say it was $100. You bought 10 Bitcoin. $10 million? Is that a good way of holding on generational wealth? I don't know. But, you know, that's just a number. The reality is there is no upper cap. And as more people throw value into it, it's going to get more valuable uh, beyond what anybody can plan. You know, when I, when I held my biggest encounter with these, uh, what I call the rocket scientists, this is um, a few years before the show uh, started, I was just awestruck by how clear thinking they were about it. You know, they, these are people who have understood game theory for the very long time, very, very early, uh, uh, early days of understanding this. And he said, listen, all it does is takes this and these are the feedback systems and this is how it perpetuates. And, and uh, you tie that to a currency, you know, and then they factor in regulators and they factor in how that's going to play out. You know, they were early days this is back when it was, Twenty thirty dollars. They were early days saying easily above a million dollars, and but their their estimate was, you know, twenty fifty, right? Um, they've all kind of reassigned that to a much earlier date. Does that make sense, Faisal? It does. And let me and let me sort of um, amplify what you're saying. You know, now, literally, the equivalent of the person pressing the buttons in the elevator, the elevator, the doorman. The taxi cab driver, they are talking about bitcoins, you know. Yeah. They are thinking how they can put a few bucks in it. I've been asked by friends so many times. Now I get uh, Facebook messages, private, you know, IMs, DMs on Twitter. Uh, hey, how, where should I buy it from? Hey, can you sell it to me? Uh, how much should I have? Hey, I've got money yeah. to invest. You know, I've got 10000 sitting aside. Should I put it in? And I keep telling them, first of all, I said, listen. I, for one, am not licensed nor qualified yeah, to give investment I. advice. It's very yeah. simple. You understand that first and foremost. So I basically wrote an article which basically says these are the rules for investing in bitcoins. Number one, you will lose everything if you are if you if you don't read up. You know. Yeah. Uh, number two, there is no there's no guarantee, and you know all the standard disclaimers. I said, having said that. This is how I would invest. If I had $150 every month, yeah, I'd plunk it into Bitcoins and some XRPs and some Litecoins and some Ethereums and God knows what else. Yeah. Or if I have $500, I do that. But the fact of the matter is that I, th I see a lot of people now looking at f three predominant things. One, they, they don't want to miss out on this boat. So that's the prom the prominent one, right? So I mean, they saw it at two thousand. They said, "Ah, nah, it's too high." It went to three. <laughs> so, they, so they were about to jump in at three. It came down to twenty six, and they said, "Ah, now see, I'm scared. See, it's all over. It's, I'm waiting just, for uh, it." Uh, yeah, and then it went back to three. And just when I said it's three, it literally hit four. And I'm sure people, you know, it's like you know, they stand and get your back off the wall. You know, let's just get on the dance floor. Uh, yeah. So I think that's one. I think the second thing is they want to park their wealth, whether it's for tax evasion purposes, you know, flight of capital. They just want to park some wealth in Bitcoin because they feel it will be safer. Uh, and the third is, the, uh, which is the, the surprising one, is they feel that this is becoming more mainstream. And if they don't start investing and start using it now, they will be left behind. They will be left holding the analog version and the analog version by the way it's not doing all that good and if a downturn came or if a crisis came or you know shit hits the fan and you know the or, economy or, goes haywire or a satellite comes in from l5 that has more gold than we've ever gone to find <laughs> so we haven't even haven't even considered that right so yeah uh, what what happens? And I see the traditional uh, naysayers, you know, saying, no, 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 no. Wealth will always, you know, classical economics always says that it will have to go towards gold and it will go to silver and commodities. But the fact of the matter is Bitcoin cryptocurrencies weren't present in your classical economic models. They weren't. And I'm, and by the way, I'm not a neoclassical economic person. I'm a neo, you know, neoeconomics. I'm, I'm a classical economist. I, I would love to, I'd love to say that I follow and, and subscribe to that theory. 
But the fact of the matter is that we have this new variable, which is called cryptocurrency, that simply wasn't there before. And we have no activated model yet, economic model, that will show how wealth, flight of wealth may go from the regulated or fiat wealth may go to the distributed leisure wealth, you know, or vice versa. So uh, I, I think we're in, we're in very exciting times, nervous times, but exciting nonetheless. Absolutely. You know, uh, Faisal, I think if the, you know, if the Milton Friedmans of the world and, um, you know, some of the uh, really early classical uh, economists were here, you know, you'd probably see them not only promoting this idea, but probably promoting it to a political ends. And, you know, that's some of the early cryptocurrency people were obviously in that uh, more anarchist type of thing. And, you know, sure, wealth is always going to try to find a way to avert uh, paying those things to society. That's the, that's the nature. If you look at some of the greatest wealth ever created. Now, when these great individuals may die, they might leave all this stuff uh, you know, of course, to their kids to to give away to charity, and they have fun doing that, building libraries and foundations and parks and whatever. Uh, we can say J.P. Morgan or something like that. But during their lifetime, they were evading, they were running, they, they were doing all sorts of things to make sure that they had the benefit to be able to create that wealth. People are not dumb. They see this around them all the time. And they look at Bitcoin as one of those things that they can participate with, uh, in, and not necessarily to uh, to not uh, participate in the the general economy. I don't think anybody's doing that in a, in a vast scale. I think what they're saying is, you know, I don't want to be left behind in the have-nots, and the new have-nots versus the haves is really centered around technology, and but not in a way that a lot of technologists think. And maybe not in a way that intellectually some of these people that are investing in this are thinking. But I think when we look back in hindsight, we'll be seeing this. And that is, you know, people just want to get paid for their time. And they want to be retaining that wealth for their time on this planet. And you can look at it philosophically in a very simple thing. So we only got X number of hours. And we get to choose more or less what we want to do with those hours. We can be a victim of our own circumstances. We can set up fence lines. We can say we're being oppressed. We can do all these different things. But in reality, nobody on this planet, nobody on this planet has it worse off than some of the best people had three or four or 5,000 years ago. You know, and the really worse off 5,000 years ago is un believably meek and bad in comparison to the worst that are here right now, no matter what their circumstances are. And they could be extremely terrible. So we have all risen much higher than where we were before. Things like this, currency has allowed some of the common folks to have access to getting out of their, getting out of their circumstances you know, and the, the very wealthy have always used that as a technique to get out. We talked about modern art. I'd like to have I any. Mean, let, let, let's not confuse it. it. This is this is not going to do upward mobility per se. You know, I mean, uh, I yeah, I don't could. see. It really, really could for miners. It did. I, I already know miners that have had no income. Yeah, I mean, but, I, but, I but but Brian, let's look at the general overall picture of what the unbanked person is. They can't own a mining rig. Oh, no, no, even no, no, no. you know, uh, so I the upward mobility would be very limited. But I do see a serious existential threat, if you will, to a serious flight of capital from the fiat ecosystem onto yeah. the crypto ecosystem. And there's nothing the governments will be able to do about Faisal, it. Faisal, isn't it really just like the internet? Really, when you think about it, what happened to news and information? What happened when the Internet opened up? Now, obviously, today there's a call to censor the Internet because there's some news and information that are, quote unquote, fake or not fake. And uh, we're on this side, we're on that side. You know something? The bottom line is we're going to find ways for people to communicate whether you like it or not. And um, ultimately, commercial companies are going to take a huge financial loss. The moment that they have acquiesced to anybody's request to remove somebody's speech, as hateful as it is, on the Internet, 
they have now slid, slid down a slippery slope that they will never recover from. Because once you say you'll remove one thing, you remove another and another. Then you have to, uh, then you have to create a committee. This is not new. Anybody listening to me, go back in history and see what censorship does. Anytime you try to create an open system and then you decide that some people are not welcome, even the most ugliest, most profoundly vile creatures, according to your definition, the reality is cosmopolitan societies, open societies like Alexandria was. Alexandria is a great, great analogy to where we are today in modern society. They were allowed to express any ideas. They were allowed to express any thoughts. They were allowed to bring any sorts of currency. They were allowed to trade anywhere. When the regulators found up, wound up getting in there, the censors, first off, the censors came in. That came under that epoch, under a religious belief system. Oh, I don't like your thoughts about the afterlife or the deity that you believe you're going to meet when you pass on. Therefore, I'm going to kill you. Right, that was Alexandria, and they, and they certainly did that, and they destroyed the uh, the um, chief librarian by torturing her for days uh, because she was promoting the idea of free thought. That moved to the Dutch. The Dutch actually controlled the world at one time because of their free thinking ways. Why am I talking about free thinking? We're talking about cryptocurrency. We're talking about Bitcoin. What I'm trying to point out to you right now, and anybody listening to me, is that we're going through this right now in our lives. The, you, you're you seeing people in commercial operations saying, well, we better smite this person. We don't like what they did. We don't like what they're saying. And we're, we're talking about a community. It's a virtual community, but still a community. We talk about self-policing. We talk about all these things. The bottom line is once you shut down any form of communication, you create a problem. And that's what the that's what the Egyptians, that's what Alexander the Great really understood. And he got that from the Egyptians, by the way. Egyptians were not the society that history would like you to believe. They didn't build pyramids by being beaten to death. Go and visit those and you tell me if a slave can make those rocks as accurate. You can't. You would die. Thousands. There are not enough people in 5,000 generations to make those rocks as flat and as perfect. That was done out of an act of love. And uh, anybody who argues against that has no reality in understanding human nature. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is we are at that precipice where the Internet has now grown. People have a smart computer in their pocket. There are governments and there are corporations were egalitarian. I won't even mention them. Anybody who's read the news the last couple of weeks and the last couple of months, especially this last election cycle in the United States, knows what the cries are for. Let's cut off these people. We don't like what they're saying. Fine. I might not particularly love anything that they're saying. It's not the point. The point is once you assign a censor, once you assign a body of regulation, you have now created your own demise. This is how all societies wind up breaking apart. People get together, they form mobs, and they decide who the bad people are. And later on, those mobs are in control by people who are not the original ones, who may have had good heart, good intent. Are you going to say that the regulators or the financial regulators who come after Bitcoin is means to an end? Yeah, in some ways. What's going to happen is, and I'm more speaking now, I'm going to transition to ICOs, and I'm, I'm more speaking now to the idea that we need to have victims for regulation to take place. This is um, throughout history, the way it works. There has to be an aggrieved, then somebody has to come in and save them, somebody ought to make a law, and then there's going to be big crackdowns. Thing is, the horse has left the barn. Unless you fundamentally destroy the society we've made up to this point, there is no turning back. As long as somebody can find a way to get news out of the most remote part of the world by putting it in, a, in, in an encrypted envelope and sending it in such a means that no censor can get to it, censorship is done. This is an imagination in people's mind. It's delusion of grandeur. And commercial companies are now participating in this, not only in foreign countries that may or may not have duly elected democratic leaders, but also in the United States. 
oh, this person has to be demonetized because we don't like what they're saying. You know, we wrap it into things that make sense to us today. But when history goes back, the great leaders from Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, you can keep going backwards. The one thing that they always wanted was communication. You do not have communication when you stop somebody from speaking. doesn't matter what they have to say. It's a fact that they're not beating you over the head. And you look at the people that are beating everybody over the head and you start saying, well, they might not have a logical agree- argument to make. So maybe the only thing that they can do is use force. And, and that's what I believe is starting, well, will start happening inside some of this. I think so much wealth is going to be starting to be invested in Bitcoin and ICOs. ICOs particularly because you're going to have some people that are just going to lose their shirts. You're going to have some people are just going to be, oh, there would have been a law. My grandma invested in this ICO. It was in her entire, her entire uh, retirement. Those people are going to be lined up and put in front of the movie and TV cameras, and we're going to hear their t- tales of woe, and we're going to say, boy, we're going to have to crack down. We're going to find a, a useful victim. There's going to be a lot of crazies out there that created ICOs that were designed to be a ripoff, and they're going to be lined up, and they're going to be made examples of. We hear the word Ponzi. We don't recognize where that came from. That was an individual that was challenging the financial system, and he was also a charlatan. But he was also at the same time challenging the existing financial system. We call out his name whenever we see something that we think is not valid. And, um, you know, that's how our society works. But it's not like, you know, the average Joe Schmo is investing in an ICO. Investing in an ICO means, well, well, not yet, not yet, right? So at, at present, if you have to go after an ICO, you pretty much are... You know, have cryptocurrency. You'll probably uh, give them their, your your BDCs, your your Ethereum's, and then get the other tokens. Keep them in a specialized wallet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you're even slightly above the average grade of being smart, I think you would know what is right for you and what's not right for you. And you're taking a risk. And I don't think so. I've come across anyone who's just said, "Hey." You know, hey, new ICO, let's just put all my wealth in it. Maybe some of them have done it. Maybe I'm sure there's no. some asshole out there who did that. But but, there, but for the majority of it, that. no. You know, and, and, and I, I, we've covered this in shows before, but I think it's very important to understand where I'm coming from. Here's where I'm coming from. In our lifetime, access to labor will be near zero. We will live with robotics, and this is not science fiction, so inexpensive that it would almost be impossible to meter. We're going to reach an area of energy that will be so inexpensive and so less impactful to what we call the environment that it would be almost unable to meter. We're going to get access to mineral and ore wealth that has never been dreamed of just by a handful of extremely small rocks we might call asteroids or meteors when they enter our atmosphere, but we get to mine them in most of our lifetimes that's listening to this. This is going to transform society, whether we like it or not. Now, guess what? If, if we, on one side, don't like that idea and the other side does, tough luck. One side is going to get it. So this is the race. The race that we're going to see in the next 10 years is who's going to get their first asteroid. Once that asteroid is, is, is captured and it's mined, all those things that we thought were really intrinsically valuable, let's just say some of the rare earth minerals that people are fighting over today, there are wars on this planet over those rare earth minerals. Have no doubts about it. If you dig deep enough, you'll understand where, why some wars are taking place. Um, there are wars, have been wars over diamonds, gold, silver, lithium, uranium. I can go on and on. Um, And now we go to the petrochemicals. Definitely wars over that. And that's about energy. All of these things are going to transform our society, whether anybody likes it or not, whether whether any organized group likes it or not. Cat's out of the bag, and there are people already doing it. Some we don't even know about. Let's just say there are people building rockets that can go to these asteroids that are not necessarily on anybody's radar. It's not just Elon Musk. And what I mean by people, some of them are governments, and some of them are just individuals with a lot of wealth. It's not that unobtainable anymore. It's not that far out. And 
when that happens, the entire infrastructure that we call our existing financial uh, structures change. At the same time, I don't think anybody needs to be woken up that we're in the middle of a social turmoil. And there are people that on all sides that want to Im- impact us on old ways and old thinking. You know, they're going to go back to their root ideologies. Are you one of us? Which, which group are you going to join? You know, and, and some of them are archaic belief systems that, that, that span back in a time when people, if they were lucky, they moved three miles from their village. And somehow we're going to apply that to this world that we live in. And, you know, and the other people on the other side of this, you know, we're going to join a one in an in a galactic government. And we're all going to sit and, and well, sit together. Yeah, that sounds great. Who's at the top? Well, we're going to vote them in. Really? That's how it works. That's how it always starts. So, I mean, we have all of these things to think about. And, and again, I'm not for or against this. Here's what I do. Th- I, I, I will say I do believe in. I believe in that individuals need to be able to thrive. I believe that every human being wants to have a better life. And I don't think most human beings, in fact, I would say a vast majority of human beings don't want to do bad things to survive, whatever bad is and how you judge that. There's a universality to that in every culture. We know what bad is. We know what good is. We don't need a government or a religion to tell us. We don't need 400,000 rules and laws to tell us. We don't need religion to tell us. And that's not anarchy. I'm not promoting that either. What I am saying is when you start putting all these things together, we have the Internet. That was phase one. We have a vast sharing of information. At the same time, we have people that want to shut it down and build little subsections of the Internet. Let's call it inside of Facebook and Twitter. And don't you dare raise your voice this way. And don't you dare say that on any side. And I want to create a safe space. Well, that's nice. And ultimately, you pay a price for that. Uh, That's all I'm saying. It's more appropriate, I think, the last couple of months than any other time in history uh, to really be contemplating this. Now, tie that to currency. Try to tie it to value. Um, when you have a government that, let's I won't say any specific government, let's just say south of my border in the United States, that decides to give itself a bit of a political and philosophical and historic lobotomy, there's a guy or a gal, a mom or a dad, a grandma or grandpa that's out in the field working. And they look up, you know, m- remove the sweat from their brow at the sun and they look around and they said, I don't know what they're doing up there at the Capitol. All I know is when I went and got food last month, it took me 10 different uh, slices of this thing we call coins. And now we have to have 50 of them. But I ain't making 50 more than I did the week before. That is what people feel. And when you start feeling that on a mass scale, people are going to look for the driftwood. They're going to look for the Noah's Ark to get their family on. And that's why these things are going to start happening. And like I said, as the economies start falling apart because because people don't know what their wealth is going to look like because they don't even know what their job is going to look like. I'll give you a good example. good example is you ask on most people in technology, and if you read most of what goes around on Facebook and Twitter about the elites that exist today, the elites are not the blacksmiths or the horseshoers of the late 1700s, because at one time, they were the, the elites of society. Today, those elites are the people who code. I happen to code, so I can say this. You need to learn how to code if you're going to make it by in this new economy. You who work with your hands making things in Detroit, you're a has-been. Yeah, you're in the middle of the Rust Belt. End of, end of days for you. Yeah. So we're the ones controlling the economy. Well, here's the problem. In 20 years, that skill set will be more or less irrelevant by artificial intelligence. Most of that coding is going to be done by machines, and they're going to do it much more effectively. Then what? What do you want your kids to study then? What's the next skill set? By the way, I've thought about this a very long time, and I know people have thought about it much deeper and much longer than I have. And they take a step back and they say, well, if you're seeing the unbuckling of society and people out in the streets, you know, beating each other over the head uh, over some ideology and, 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 and raising different flags of uh, tribalism, you know, you're to that tribe and you're with that tribe, 
take a couple of steps back and see what's really going to happen when people wake up and start understanding the possibility of everything that we thought that was going to create wealth is not there. And digging a hole in the ground is not going to be as relevant when I can move one rocket uh, to one asteroid and get more than anybody could dig in 50 years in the space of a couple of days, right? I mean, when you start looking at that, this is the, the transformations that we're going to have in our society. So coming back to the ground now, then I'll take you to the far le levels of this, we're facing this right at this moment with the ICO craze. And you don't hear us talking a lot about it. I mean, we, we, it, was, it, was, it was altcoins back in the early days, us grandpas and this, uh, Faisal and I and, and Mike, uh, when we started this, we were talking about sure. alternative. I, I, I tell you, the struggle is coins. very real to keep up. <laughs> yeah, so now they're ICOs, right? And, and really what they are is, is the ability for you to directly invest in something that you believe in, whether that's an individual, whether that's a company, whether that's an idea. And it is beyond Wild West City. You study America during the gold rush and the Wild West City that took place out there. That's what's going on. Now, the regulators didn't come out to Wild West City until really the, the, the early 1900s when you really get down to it. Um, there's a lot of reasons they didn't want to regulate for a while because it was generating a tremendous amount of wealth and a tremendous amount of change. And it lifted society up. San Francisco, the Silicon Valley, was built on the gold rush. There would be no Silicon Valley today, or all of the things, Stanford University, all of the things that come around from that, if there was not a gold rush. That's, that is a fact. And that entire center of gravity would not have existed there. Now, some people think that's abstraction. They'll say, well, that's a big abstraction, Brian. No, it isn't. That was a, an accumulation of wealth. Second generation wealth said, let's start funding third generation wealth. That started a lot of the early VCs. Very important to understand. Prior to that, the concept of the VC that we know today really didn't exist. The Dutch created the basic idea of that with contracts of insurance and limited, uh, limited partnerships, if you will, but not in the sense that we have in the modern context. And before that, we can go Knights Templar, we can go back in history. We are experiencing that right now in our lives. It is unbelievable difference in the fact that individuals and not private groups can collaborate in this space. This is the transformation of society. There are some people who are in the fields right now with sweat on their brow, and they might, in fact, somehow on their smartphone connect to an ICO that resonates with them. And all of a sudden, they're not in the field anymore. This is upward mobility 101, and it will impact some people's lives. Will it wind up impacting people in a negative direction? Of course. Absolutely. Bitcoin could, will possibly go down near zero. It's a possibility. Yeah, I just said that. But it's possibility it's going to go up much, much further than I could even speculate. Uh, ICOs could crash. Regulators could make it all illegal. People are going to go into jail. All kinds of things. But at the end of the day, we're experiencing that. So you take a couple of steps back and, and not be a mania on this, although it is a mania to a certain extent. You take a few steps back and you say, what does this mean? It means the old order, right? If you, I'll give you an example. I know people right now in AI that are doing tremendous work in AI, voice-first AI. And they went and th they did the usual rounds in the Silicon Valley. They said, please fund my startup. And, and these uh, folks have decided that it's just not the path that they're going to go on. You know, the, the next thing is mixed reality, and that's what we've invested billions in, and we're not going to give you anything in this voice-first stuff. You know what these folks are going to do? They said, screw it. No, I'll tell you exactly what they said. They said, fuck it. I'm going to do an ICO. I'm going to present my case to the users directly, and I'm going to let them democratically decide whether my idea is of any value. It started with Kickstarter and those types of GoFundMes and things like that, and it very well may end with this new sort of freefall. And what this means is the concentration of power is decentralized. And But I'm not just talking about you know decentralized capitalization. I'm talking about the power that comes with that. The people who put money into companies are, in fact, picking the winners and losers. Uh, and the people who are sensing, censoring people are picking winners and losers. And that is antithetical 
to what formed the internet and the ideas around the internet. So if you study history long enough, you understand the human spirit transcends all of this. They transcend every religion. They transcend every political system. They transcend every opportunity to be controlled. This is why life is here. It's not just humanity. It's all life. We can try as we, as we might to try to kill humanity. We might be successful. I doubt it. No matter how bad, badly we might, you know, some guy over there might press a button and we press a button and all that. I think humanity is going to survive. I don't want to see it. I'm just talking about life in general. I know this. You can never eradicate all life from this planet. Ever. Will never happen. You can go into volcanic vents, into Hades, if you will, and there's life there. There's life inside of rocks, inside of solid rocks. We can crack open a rock. Some people say, well, it came in there when you cracked open. No, there's life, dormant life in those rocks. And there's a lot of research that shows this. I can go to the desert. I go this every, um, every couple of years ago, and I, I see this. These little miniature shrimp that sit under the sand, apparently dead. They have no heartbeat. They can't breathe under the sand. Are they eggs? No, they're not eggs. They are dormant shrimp. They call them fairy shrimp. They are f- magical in a way. A little water, a little sunlight, a little cooling down. They rise up. They reproduce in a frenzy. And they go down and they wait for the next time. And sometimes they last a few generations. Sometimes they don't. Some scientists disagree with that. They think it's just one generation they die off. New research, and I was there watching this research the last time I, I visited, has proven by looking at the DNA evidence that these shrimp have, some have done 50 generations. It's not 50 years. Sometimes this could be 100 years. So life is going to survive. But in the middle of all this is this turmoil. And I think Faisal, you and I talked about this pre-show, and we've talked about it, you know, many other shows. I think we're going into this direction to sort of maybe help people understand that all of this chaos is probably going to happen. Uh, it's probably going to affect everybody that's hearing my voice, no matter what part of the world you're in. Uh, and I'm not saying go dig a hole in doomsday prepper. You should do that anyway. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, why? Because it's inevitable. I mean, nobody is going to stop the cycles that take place in... in, uh, and, in and, and one is due because eight-year cycles, if you, if you believe Ray Dalio and what yeah. he says and everyone else, you know, eight years have gone by since the last cycle. We need a depression. There, there's we also a hundred... Yeah, there's a hundred-year political cycle. There's a 500-year well, anyway, political cycle. But we're yeah. running out of time, but Brian, yeah. you know, we'll take this next week. But, uh, you know, it's a great show. I, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, Bitcoin is an alternative. But as with everything else, please, you know, refer to our disclaimers, uh, which is, yeah. you know, you invest with your own risk and your own money and your own, co- you know, your, your own conscious. So I, don't I, stake I, I whatever we say. I want to make it yeah. clear. I'm, an am- I'm a rank amateur. I'm a student. I'm an expert in nothing. All right. That's my grain of salt. Either you yep. resonate with what I'm saying and you want to research it or you don't. I mean, yep. you can please read, can, read, yeah, read, 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 and, read. And even the pundits, you know, the pundits and all the gurus and be careful because <laughs> everyone's a guru these days. That's the, that's yeah, every, the power of the yeah, Internet. Right. The great yeah, equalizer. Instant guru, you know, and, and, and I, I think the best thing we can do is to create this uh, awareness and dialogue. That's why we went a little deep and wide on this, is to try to understand the backdrop of all this is taking place. I, I believe that we need to organize as people. So I believe in governments. I believe that you need banking infrastructure. I believe that you need elected rep- representatives. I believe that you need regulation uh, to a certain degree. So, you know, this has nothing to do with uh, current politics. And I, I, I got to say, I probably disagree with most political uh, organizations um, because uh, ultimately they believe that, like religions, that they are the end-all and be-all of what they uh, are professing. And I, I think anybody that wants to profess absolute knowledge uh, is absolutely wrong, you know, and, and, and I think we're in that world today. Uh, I, I don't know about your parts of the world, Faisal. I think you probably see a little bit more than I do, but this absolute knowledge, it does not exist. We're all students. We're all on this journey. We can use history as our guide. And that's all I can say with people, but between now and the next show, you might start seeing some ICOs go into the stratosphere. Uh, we talked about, you know, one of the second most invested ICOs, 
in the next couple of days, we might see ones that will look make that look minuscule. And there are going to be a lot more after that. And uh, we'll probably have more shows about it. Uh, we're going to have more people that are much closer yeah. to it. And, you know, not only just that, you know, there are more, uh, I, I would say, colorful ways of now interacting with us. Yes. We, we are now thinking about, you know, do we do a live show now that there's Facebook Live and there's so much else to do? Do we launch a YouTube vlog? Uh, you know, give us your suggestions. We're open for all. We're looking at how much time we can carve out. And until next week, you know, Brian and I are off the mic and we'll speak to you next week. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>